All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Moana Lecture 5. And today we are going to be talking about Maui, trying to understand the crazy creature that Maui is, and then also trying to understand how Moana relates to relates to him and try to understand the heroine's journey, the archetypal heroine's journey that, well, is different from the hero's journey. So that's going to be something that's interesting. Um, if you haven't seen the first four lectures, I have the link to the first one right up here. And um, and yeah, I mean, you could watch this lecture and you don't really have to watch the first four. They're designed like that. But at the same time, obviously, it's better if you watch the first four. So, um, well, let's try to piece apart the heroine's journey. And it starts with Maui, right? Who is Maui and how do these two relate? So, well, first, let me explain to you what the heroine's journey is, actually. And this is this is a good place to explain it. So the heroine's journey is quite simple, but quite extreme. So the, the psychological basis for it relies in this theory called sexual selection theory. And the theory essentially states, right? And well, it's based off the fact that across all of human history, 40% of all men are reproductively successful and 80% of all women are reproductively successful. So that's a big gap, right? So for every one woman, there is two men that exist. And what usually happened is that two men were able to get with one woman. And you see this across, you know, in today's society where you have people like Hugh Hefner, you know, Dan Blazerian, you know, James Bond, these type of figures. Will Chamberlain had sex with over 15,000 women in his life. So you have people like this who are able to, well, impregnate multiple women and therefore um, exacerbate the fact that 60% of all men were not able to be reproductively successful. So that creates the hero's journey. The hero's journey is, well, 40% 40, 40 of the time I'll be successful, 60% of the time I won't as a man. So therefore, I need to stand out from the crowd to be successful right, to be re reproductively successful. Something that I have to do needs to make me reproductively successful. And also, you know, if I stand out the most, then I'll be in that top one to 0.1%, which is like the Will Chamberlains of the world and the, the Dan Blazerians and the James Bonds, those type of characters. You know, I'll have everyone want me and therefore have, well, we'll say most of the reproductive opportunities with the most attractive females. But... And therefore, that's why you have this idea of going on a hero's journey and um, and doing something incredibly risky, sort of like Christopher Columbus, right? Like these adventurers, these explorers, who why would they want to go in a boat, right, and sail across the sea? It's because there's opportunity that, that lies into that. And if you were to just stay in the place where you are, then you're most likely going to fail. For women, it's quite different, though. For women, the whole goal, evolutionary goal, is not to stand out. Because if you stand out, then you're probably going to be ostracized, right? That's that's something that you see across like middle middle school and high school women, right? The, the ones that properly form themselves within the social group are the ones that, you know, get invited to the most parties and therefore have the most, um, or just get in, get in with the guys and are most reproductively successful across time. So, um, so the purpose for a heroine, right, evolutionarily speaking, right, is um, is to operate within the bounds of s sexual selection. That's a good way of saying it because it would be stupid for a woman, for example, to go on a boat, right, and, and sail across the sea because why would you want to do that, right? Why would you want to risk everything that you have when you could stay here and be reproductively successful? So what is the archetypal heroine's journey the archetypal heroine's journey is to take a man a man who is well rough around the edges slightly egotistical probably doesn't really know who he is yet because he's just kind of like prancing around killing animals essentially and um and to tame him right to to really make him into something that's well socialized and this was you could there was a book called a billion wicked thoughts that i thought was really good it it details essentially women's sexual fantasies and it's sort of you you get that idea right like that's 50 shades of gray that's um titanic 
I don't know if that's Titanic. But that's that's definitely there's there's an old book. It was called um, it's called the fl- the fire and the fl- the flame and the flower. And that was one of the most popular like literature romantic books. And and there's there's the same theme across it. That's also Beauty and the Beast, right? Beauty and the Beast is you have this heroine who goes in and tries to tame the aggressive male and make him well socialized and make him a good person. So, um, that's the heroine's journey. And the best part about Moana is as you go through, and this is something that I've never ever seen before. As you go through, she goes on a hero's journey and a heroine's journey. She does both. So throughout this entire storyline, they were able to fit the fact that she she breaks societal norms, sails out to the sea, right? And um, and restores the hearts of Tefiti, right? That's a hero's journey right there. But she also goes on this heroine's journey of taking this wildly aggressive, egotistical male and, um, and taming him and, and well, turning him from a beast, right, which is Beauty and the Beast, turning him from a beast into a, well, human. That's a better way of saying it, right? To turn him into something that doesn't see women and doesn't see the world as a, as a place of things to be conquered or things to be explored. It sees the world with a, with a lens that maybe this is a, a world full of life, right? And that's, that's what the feminine side gets to show. So it really hits both sides of... Um, of life, so you know, if you if you like Moana, you could like her for the fact that she's a hero or the fact that she's a heroine, and both of those are completely fine. But we're gonna take this this one time to really piece out the heroine's journey that goes within it. So first, let's understand um, who Maui is and really what why he needs to be fixed. Essentially, fix is a good way of saying it because he's he's pretty messed up. So Moana. And the things aren't we all messed up. So Moana, she um, she gets onto this this um, island, right? And she finds Maui. And the first thing that you see about Maui is that you just want to slap him, right? Like this is that's like the first impression. Everybody, when you look at this guy, you just want to slap him. You know, she, he like she's doing her little like thing, and he corrects her. Actually, it's Maui, shapeshifter, demigod of the wind and sea, right? Like he's just like building up his ego. He's a very egotistical guy, and um. Well, that's, that's probably his main problem. His problem is he's egotistical and also, well, he lost his hook, right? So we'll get into that. we got to figure out, first of all, why is he like this, right? Why is he like this? And also, you know, if we're going to go back to the main um, original sin that we talked about in the previous lectures, you know, he still believes that you need to sort of confront this beast, right? So... Well, he's very repressive, right? If we're going with that same analogy, he's, he's very repressive and he's not in touch with himself, let's say. He fights against the parts of himself. So, and we'll see that, right? So what's his story? His mom, right? And you find this with his tattoos. His mom throws him into the sea and um, and he feels like he's worthless, right? Makes sense, right? Like, don't we all feel like we're worthless? You know, I guess that's not a... It's not a difficult thing, and I'll actually, I this actually plays very well into my story, so I could actually piece this together. So, um, so then what happens is, he he was not, he didn't feel worthy, right? He didn't feel like he was worthy to be. He didn't feel like he was contributing any value to the world. That's a good way of saying it. So what did he do? He became a shapeshifter. Right, he became somebody who could turn into different animals, and um, and well, what does that mean, right? What does that mean? It means that Maui, in his, we'll say, insecurity, right, in his insecurity, to um, to be liked, right, because obviously he has trouble being liked, which we all struggle with as children, you know, in his in his struggle to be liked, he decides that he's gonna shift. He's going to change his being, change the person that he shows himself as to a different person, depending on what people desire of him. So he doesn't have a self. He doesn't have a core. He just shifts with whatever people want. And you could see this with um, with people who show different parts of their personality, right? Like 
who, whenever they're with their parents, are one type of person, and whoever are with their with their friends are a different type of person. And then if you put them into four different social groups, they're gonna be four different people across those four different social groups. It's because they don't know who they are. They they just they'll mend their personality. They'll shift their personality. They'll be a shapeshifter to um to hopefully be liked across all of those different social groups. And well, it's a problem, right? It's a problem because then you're never you, right? You never develop in a, um, in a traditional sense, you never develop an ego, right? You never develop a sense of who you are, an individual ego, which is a good thing, right? It's a good thing to know who you are and a good thing to know what you like and a good thing to know how you present yourself to the world. Because a big problem with with um, the agreeable types who end up doing this, right? Well, they tend to be agreeable, but you know, not not completely. Is that they end up backstabbing people because they they just do you know they end up betraying because they're like, all right, I'm gonna do this thing to to make myself liked in this group, then I'm gonna do this thing to make myself liked in this group, and then they end up coming into conflict. The personalities. I did this to some. Oops. Sorry, mom. So. I did this to some degree with, um, well, in my, we'll say, 17 to 18 years old. That was probably my way of doing it. I probably wasn't tremendously extreme on it, but but it, uh, I was pretty bad. I was pretty bad. What I did was, not in, not in a personality sense, but I really had no idea of discovering, like, who am I and who, what is it that makes me give value to the world, right? Because that, that's a... That's a tough question to ask yourself, sitting back and saying, wait a second, maybe maybe I'm not as valuable as I think. So what did I do, right? And that's that's this, right? I looked at the world and I was like, I'm not really contributing. I'm like 17, 18 years old and, um, and there's not much that I'm doing. So what did I do? I went on this crazy schedule where I worked like 80, 90 hours a week, something like that, something ridiculously, I'll say perverted, right? Something that was just wrong. And, um, and I changed my personality because of my insecurity of, okay, maybe I, I don't contribute that much to the world and maybe my life isn't as meaningful as I thought. And, um, and I became a shapeshifter, right? I, I distanced myself from my own personality because I was like, well, that's the only way that I'll, I'll handle this insecurity and, and, um, and figure out, you know what, maybe, maybe I do have some value that I contribute to the world. So it was, it's probably, it, it wasn't the healthiest thing we'll say, but that's that's what that's what you do when you confront your shadow. You you face it and you say, "Wait a second. Why am I working 80 to 90 hours a week, burning myself out? Maybe it's because of this." You find your insecurity and then you work through it. So um that was Maui's problem, right? Maui's problem was he was a shapeshifter, so he would do anything to um to make other people happy. So what did he do? He removed the heart of Tefiti. He removed it for the people. Right, so that's that's exactly what betrayal is, right? When I say betrayal, you know, he is removing the the heart of life. He's removing the source of life from the world or from himself, you could say, just to satisfy other people. And that's exactly what betrayal is. You know, betrayal is you're removing the sense of trust, right? If trust is life, right? Some you could just see the this, the heart is something incredibly valuable, right? That's almost. That's almost mystical, almost, you know, cannot be explained. Like what makes a heart valuable? It's just the fact that it's so powerful and trust in a relationship is obviously incredibly powerful. If you betray somebody, you remove the heart from this, well, part of them and, um, and you do it for other people. So that's exactly what now he's doing. He's essentially betraying humanity. He's betraying himself because he well, wanted to make other people happy. Um, but he hasn't really learned from his past. You know, like he sings this whole song. He's like, you're welcome, right? He's like, and he talks about how much, how all of the amazing things that he's done. And that's that's really the the protective shield that he puts over his ego to um, to protect against the fact that he failed. That's, yeah, the fact that he failed. And, um, Yes, and here, so then we get into this idea of the tattoos, right? And the, t the tattoos relate perfectly to this idea. This is, this is actually perfect. So when I said that I added all my value, 
all of the value that I had in my personal life was contributed to how much of my accomplishments I achieved, right? All of the good things that I did for the world, and if I didn't do enough good things for the world, then I was completely valueless. That was one of the assumptions that was in my, we'll say, insecurities. That's exactly what these tattoos represent. The tattoos, they show up when he earns them, right? So whenever he, we'll say, whenever he does something good, it's something that contributes to his ego. It contributes to his sense of self, and that's why they become his tattoos. That's why they become a part of him. So you could say the thing that builds up Maui is his tattoos, which is the value that he contributes to the world. The only problem is, let's see if I could find it here. It says here, it was never enough. It was never enough. Whenever he said, okay, I'm going to contribute as much value as I can to the world, the only thing you realize is the world is so damn messed up that you can't do everything to fix the world. Like we look at someone like Martin Luther King and we say, wow, he has done so much. He's accomplished so much and he's a hero. But there's a tremendous amount of work to be left, a tremendous amount of work left to be done, right? So contribute... So aligning your value, your personal value to the world with your accomplishments is something that, well, the problem is you will never have enough. It's almost like an addiction. And that's what workaholism is kind of like. It's literally saying that if I don't, if I don't fix every single problem that exists in the world and dedicate all my energy to it, then I'm a failure as a person. And, then, and the problem is you're never going to get rid of all the problems because problems are we'll say the only universal truth. The only universal truth, or one of, one of the few universal truths, is that problems will never go away. So his goal was to get rid of all the problems, and there's, there's no way of doing it. So, well, that's, that's his essential problem, right? He says that I am, I, I, I attribute my value to my accomplishments, and um, And I'm willing to do that because I am going to, because I want to help other people to fix this little insecurity. And hey, listen, I experienced the same thing. So maybe I identify with Maui. Never know. So, um, so then, yes, I like, I like this idea of the, so now we get more into his tattoos and he's got this little, these little people on his tattoos and they're all, they're, it's like they're interacting with him. And I like that if we, you know, I, I explained a little bit before about the personality theory and, um. Well, this, this is the perfect representation. You know you know the idea of like the angel and the devil on your shoulder? That's exactly what this is. This is literally the same thing. And um, well, this is a representation of his conscience, right? If you watch as it goes throughout the movie, you know, whenever he does something that's super egotistical, he's going to, um, his conscience is going to be like, shut up, like what's wrong with you? And whenever he does something good, right, where he's sort of developing, then eventually him and his conscience become in sync. But the main problem with him in the beginning, right, is this, right, is that he goes to high five his conscience and his conscience doesn't respond. So clearly there's a little bit of a disunion between, well, his ego, right, his ego is obviously the guy who wants to high five and his conscience, right, the part of him that knows what's right, but it seems like he's blinded by his ego, and that's why we go in the that's why you have the heroine's journey. So, um <laughs> another problem with, with Maui, this guy's full of full of problems. So <laughs> I think this is really funny. So he's been on this island for a thousand years, right? And it, it's it's almost as if he's failed his hero's journey, right? Like he was a hero and he did all of his stuff, but then he hit some wall and he and he failed. So what you're left with now is this sort of, it's it's called the undeveloped self, right? It's the, the part of you that, well, let's say you were a hero for, we'll say the first 15 years of your life. And you know, that's the part of you that really wanted to change the world and, and do things that were really gonna impact society and all that stuff. And then after a while, let's say you turn 15 and you realize that your dreams are a little bit harder than you imagined. You know, becoming an artist isn't, you know, becoming a musician is not as easy as it looks. You know, you see someone like, you know, the top 10 artists, and then you don't really think about the bottom, well, we'll say 10 to 10,000 artists that want to be in the top 10, but really can't. So, um, so that's really what Maui was like. Maui hit the hit the problem that he couldn't solve, and um, and then he just kind of gave up. and And then what happens is you see this in Star Wars, for example. You have um, <laughs> you have 
Anakin Skywalker is for 20 years he's a hero and then he turns into Darth Vader and then when he dies you see that he's his hero self was undeveloped right it, it's sort of it, it's not mature enough right because it sort of decays and that's exactly what Maui looks like in this picture right it's it's him and he wanted to transform into his hawk he wanted to transform into whatever but he just ends up as this like this shark that's it's like a like a beta male shark, if that's if that's a way of putting it. Like, look how sad he looks. He just looks so deformed and and unhappy. You know, that's that's the undeveloped self. That's the that's the hero side of him that's been well decaying over the last, in this case, a thousand years. So, um, well, so the main problem that he that he experiences, and this this is the thing that we we. We, we talked about this a little bit before, right, is that he has this idea that um, he is in control, right? He has this illusion that he is in control of everything, and um, he can control every part of his unconscious. So, you know, you see that with the tattoos, where he tries to high-five the tattoo, and he's a little confused as to why the tattoo isn't high-fiving him back, but then he really doesn't care because he doesn't really pay attention to it. And then he also says... You know, I created the wind and sea and I did all this good stuff. So I'm essentially a god. And then he also believes that he can control himself, right? He can control his, his shape-shifting abilities. And all he needs is his precious hook, right? That's all he needs. But the problem with that is that, well, this is the thing that humans must grapple with across all dimensions, right? Is that maybe us humans are not in control. Maybe when we say that we are going to do something, right? This is this is just the most basic example. When we say that we're going to pull an all-nighter and sl and not sleep and say, oh yeah, you know, I could just push through it. I could just do it. And then you find yourself either falling asleep or not being able to concentrate or, well, not doing well in the test the next day because of whatever problem or not getting the project done or whatever. It's because you re you must come to that realization at some point that maybe sleep is something that is outside of your control. Maybe you have to sleep eight hours a day just because, well, if you don't, then you're screwed and you can't control that. And we have to, we have to grapple with this across every single domain. And, um, and while well, that's, that's the representation of fighting Teka and losing, right? But Maui, still in his egotistical belief, he still believes. He says the ocean is straight up kooky dukes, right? And the, and the ocean is clearly some representation of, you know, um, well, the unconscious, right? Some spirit, some part of the spiritual world. And he just sort of denies it right away because he sort of believes that um, he's in control, right? Like the ocean is in control. He's in control, which... Well, so there are all of his flaws. Let's see if we could, let's see if we could go through all of his flaws. So he's a he's he's insecure, so that makes him a shapeshifter, right? He does he does everything for his for the people, he doesn't do it for himself. Then which he takes a little bit too far, right? Then he attributes his self value to the accomplishments that he achieves, which is a problem, right? Third part, super egotistical, not in touch with the rest of his rest of his unconscious because his ego just kind of kind of crushes it and says don't even you know conscience i'm not going to listen to you right like whatever whatever little angels talking to me on the shoulder i don't really care and the fourth problem or the fourth problem is that he is an undeveloped self so even though he ends up getting his hook he's just um well rusty is a good way of saying it well decayed decayed's a better word of saying it so those are his four problems oh and we could find even the fifth problem is that he's afraid of the spiritual world right he's sort of denying it and um and he said i'm not going to worry about this anymore because i failed right and that's the hero's journey so she's you see uh moana shows him the heart of defeaty and he's just like i am not dealing with this he goes it's a homing beacon of death and um you can look at moana's face there she's like what are you even talking about and um and the problem is, right, what he's, what he's essentially saying is, I'm denying spirituality itself, right? I'm denying the fact that something else can control me. So that's the same idea, right? I'm denying the fact that I'm not in control of the heart of Tefiti. This thing is just completely out of my control, and I'm just not even going to bother with it. 
You see this in our society, right? You see this all the time. Um, the best example, well, is the Salem Witch Trials, right? The Salem Witch Trials is essentially, right, in the 1600s, a bunch of people saw things that they couldn't understand, spiritual things that they really couldn't understand, and they couldn't explain it with a rational perspective. So what did they do, right? And something that we obviously could say now is wrong, right? They just said, it must be some sort of devilish creatures from hell coming in to destroy us. And, um, and then they executed the witches, right? And that's, that's exactly what it is. So you look at when, when Mo uh, Maui says it's a homing beacon of death, he looks upon the things that, that he can't explain, the things that are spiritual, and just says, I'm not going to worry about that. That's, that's out of my control. That's personally what I believe which ha what happens with, um, with Christianity and, well, aggression and sexuality, right? Homosexuality included. You look at their representations of that and they say, this is too much to explain in rules, right? Because, you know, trying to explain the, the logistical rules of sex are so damn complicated. Same for aggression because... Well, aggression could be a good thing, and it could also be a bad thing, and, and trying to regulate that with a specific rule is really, really difficult. So it's, a, it's the same thing with sex, right? So what, what do they say? They say, none of it. I don't want any aggression, right? That's what Jesus said, and I don't want any sex. I don't want you to experience any of this. And, um, well, that's fear, right? That's fear. You're saying, essentially, like Maui, you're saying, this thing that I don't understand, this thing that's a little bit too complex is... Um, just completely cut it out because it's it has the potential to do a tremendous amount of harm, which is unfortunately true. So um so I like that. It says can't explain it, must be evil, right? That's 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 one of the problems with the logos, and that's one of the problems with logic, right? Logos is logic, and one of the problems with the ego is saying, hey listen, everything that I can't explain must be must be I, I am either not going to focus on it or I am going to, well, throw it away. So this is what Moana has to essentially deal with, right? She's got five problems that she's got to essentially fix, and, um, and that's the heroine's journey. So there's a – it took me a while to I, – I actually had to watch it again and, and try to understand. You know, there's this idea of, like, what was it that chose – that made Moana worthwhile? What was it that made her... What was it the, the thing that made her chosen, right, to go on this journey? And um, and what was it that made her a good heroine? And it's actually explained in the beginning. And I, I want to take you through because it's literally a two-minute story of the heroine's journey. This is literally what it is. And this is her as a kid. If you remember, um, this is the scene where Moana saves the turtle, right? And this is her as a baby, two years old. So what happens is she goes to the um to the sea and she sees this she this this seashell god she sees this seashell and she goes to pick it up she's like oh cool seashell right and um and we'll say well if you've ever seen the marshmallow test right as a kid you you imagine that it's like sugar right or a representation of self interest which we'll get into so she sees the um this sea seashell, she goes to pick it up, but then she turns around, she realizes that there's this little turtle sitting right over here that is far away from the shore, and he needs to return home, right? He needs to return to the shore, and, um, well, he's, he's dealing with a bunch of problems here. He's dealing with these birds that are trying to swarm him, right? And clearly, he looks a little disturbed, and, um, and he needs some help getting from the land to the ocean, right? He needs some help getting from, we'll say, I'm trying, I'm trying to explain this in a s symbolistic sense, symbolic sense, um, to get from the place where he doesn't belong to the place where he does belong and we'll dig deeper into that so now moana is left with this choice right she's left with this choice do i go with my self-interest with this seashell or do i go for the turtle right which one do i choose do i go for the you know that's that's the marshmallow test right what you do do, do you go for you know your heart or do you go for your impulsive animalistic desires right and um 
And this is the test, right? This is the test that essentially the world or the ocean puts her to. And she chooses to save the turtle, right? She says, I'm going to, I'm going to let go of my self-interest to pursue a humanistic cause, right? Some cause that is worthwhile and meaningful. So she, she, she saves the turtle, protects him from the birds. And, um, and the, the bird, the bird flips him over, right? The bird does this thing that's kind of, well, essentially called a setback. And then she flips him back over and lets him into the water, right? You see the turtle going right here and she's all happy about it, right? And what is the, what is the message there? It's like, okay, she chose herself. She chose something that existed beyond her self-interest. She chose humanity over greed or roughly greed, roughly. And, um, and the world, the ocean chose her for that reason. It rewarded her for it and said, if I want somebody to restore the hearts of Tefiti, if I want somebody to restore life back to society, she needs to be a representation of life itself. Her motivations need to exist beyond the humanistic desires, beyond the self-pleasure desires, and to extend into something that's a little bit more, actually humanistic is probably the right word, to extend to something that is, well, spiritual, right? And you would see, you know, that's that's exactly what the representation of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you know, spiritual creatures who only cared about other people didn't really care about themselves. And and that's how they were able to restore life back into society, right? Like that, that's a that's a fundamental archetype. That's a strong idea. And that's the same thing that happens with Beauty and the Beast, right? Beauty and the Beast, or if you were to take this back to just a regular male female relationship right to be able to well that's okay beauty and the beast is you take the female right and she puts everything she puts her desires out of it right she chooses to be imprisoned by the beast and she decides to save her father and then therefore she's able to um restore the heart of the beast right it's the same idea this is the heroine's journey 101 right we would imagine this turtle Instead of this turtle, we're going to say this turtle is the representation of a man, right? And we'll say this: these um, birds are the representation of ego, temptation, flaws, um, insecurities, all of the all of the problems that a man, a undeveloped man, struggles with as he goes through maturity and tries to develop a strong ego and become in touch with his humanity. Then we'll say that, okay, what, what must the heroine do? She must put aside her own self-interest to, um, she must put aside her own self-interest to help this man come from the land, right? This turtle or this man to come from the land, to come from the logos, right? Because if we're to say, if we're to use the symbolism of, well, the ocean is something spiritual, right? The ocean is something that is mystical and difficult to understand which is the representation of the spirit and we're going to say the land is the logical thing that people decide to stay on right we've already formed that idea in this moana series um because you have the grandma who loves the water and you have the dad who loves staying on the land right and the goal of the heroine is to put aside her self-interest to help the man go from logic and rationality and ego and guide him escort him to the land of the mystical and um and to understand himself a little bit deeper right to go into the deeper parts of himself and she must she must help him fight off the birds right go through whatever setbacks um and um and help him restore himself and that's why the ocean chose her Okay, okay. Moana 5.2. Wonderful. Okay, so we've reached the end of that. That is the heroine's journey in a nutshell. And now we're going to watch it actually play out. So we're going to see how it actually affects Maui. So you can see Maui's a little bit dismissive and annoying and egotistical, which is exactly his problem. And, um... And well, that's sort of the deal here, right? Like Moana is gonna 
is going to lead him along the way, and then she's also going to help him control himself, and then he's going to be the one who restores the balance, right? Easy. What they must do, so here we go into the actual adventures, right? So this is essentially moving the turtle from the from the lands, moving him across the sands. So one of the things that, that she has to do is restore his... Well, so one of his problems is that he's lost his ego, right? He's an undeveloped self, and he really has no idea who he is at the moment or what he has, what he's currently capable of, capable of doing. It feels like he's sort of lost it. So what do they have to do? They have to go into this realm of monsters and get his hook, right? And that's where you meet the crab. And um, I, I, didn't, I didn't think there was that much going into the crab. You just meet the crab, and you get his hook, Right? And um, and that's actually the point where you see this this little shark head figure, right? Where he's just a little like you can imagine like a low testosterone, <laughs> low testosterone forty year old dude or something like that. You know, like he's just not he's just not in it. But she gets to working with him, she gets to talking with him, and they um, will say summon his power, right? Like it, he starts to no. That's a better way of saying it is. He wasn't in touch with the hero part of himself, right? He literally was distanced from that for about a thousand years, and he was undeveloped, just like you think of like a Darth Vader, right? And that same idea. He was he was Darth Vader was distanced from himself for twenty years, and um and Maui was distanced from himself for a part of his life, and therefore he has to rediscover that part within himself. So that's exactly what he does. And you can see there's a look of confidence on his face. So what happens is now they start to develop a little relationship. And, um, well, he starts to take, we'll say, interest in her. Because it's, it's a little ambiguous, you know. If this was not a Disney story, unequivocally, these two characters would fall in love unequivocally there's there's almost no story where where they don't fall in love in mythology but obviously the fact that this is a disney story is like all right maybe maybe the thousand year old demigod shouldn't fall in love with the 15 year old princess i would say good call disney but you know the mythology is you know obviously there, there's there's something here that's a little bit more than just a typical two friends getting together and that's the point of the heroine's journey you know the heroine's journey is not that's the reason why i say this the purpose of the heroine's journey is to take a man civilize him and fall in love it's not to just you know pick a random dude and say hey listen i'm just gonna help you and then leave you know we're self-interested creatures so um So that's what happens. They have this little, they have this little struggle restoring his confidence, right? And this, this is, um, this is part of it. She starts to restore his confidence, and to restore his confidence, exactly what she needs to do is she needs to. Well, it's funny because originally she tries to give him some sort of like logical appeal as to why he should become a hero or whatever, and um, and like I said in the previous lectures, you can't give a logical explanation for why to be a hero. You can't because. There is no logical explanation for why to be hero. And the better way of looking at it is the logical side of you is not the part of you that's the hero. The part of you that's the hero is the adventurous, childlike part of you. It's the part of you that gets super excited for no reason and wants to, you know, well, whenever you go and set on a goal, you're like super passionate about doing it, whatever it is. And, um... That is not the rational side of your brain. So if you try to trigger the rational side of someone's brain to get them going, it's it's not really going to do anything. So this is why she starts to she understands, right? And this is this is part of the anima figure. This is part of the we'll say female figure, feminine figure. She goes and she triggers his emotions, right? And um and she triggers the part of him that he's been repressing. And that's that's a good idea. This is a good idea that I think could really apply to, well, everyone who is old and understands this, right? I, I, I talked to my friends about this and we sort of came to this realization and I think it's true across all dimensions. Guys have a specific thing that they talk about with guys and they show a specific aspect of their personalities. And same for girls, right? It's different aspects, but it's the same thing. But then... But you don't show this. 
But when a guy talks to a guy, he is a completely different person for when he talks to a girl, right? They are two completely different people. And you could say that the feminine spirit, right? The feminine person brings out the a different part of him than just talking with guys. You know, when you talk to guys, it's more of like what's traditionally known as guy talk. And then when you talk to girls, it's it's a little bit deeper. It's a little bit more introspective, all of these things. And that's part of the heroine's journey. And it's the same thing with the same thing with girls. Girls, well, they're tremendously introspective when they talk to other girls. And when they're with guys, it's as if they, well, I don't know. I don't know what it brings out in them, but that's not the purpose of this discussion. So, so Maui, you know, he has this sort of introspective experience, right? And this is the part where he realizes that all of the things that he did was never enough, right? So if we're going back to the problems that he was experiencing, one of them was that he atta- he attached his ego, he attached his self-worth to all of the accomplishments that he figured out. And, um, and this is the point where he comes to that realization, you know? Maybe, maybe the system of thinking that he's been using for his entire life is wrong. That's a tough way of looking at it. That's like, that's like going up to a Christian and saying, you know, a diehard Christian saying, maybe there's something wrong with your theory. And, um, or, or, you know, Jordan Peterson says, he goes, I used to talk to these fundamentalist Christians. And those are the, those are the people who believe that, um, Christianity is fact, like, like, objective fact. So there's a there's a belief in the fundamental Christians that the world is 6,000 years old, even though, you know, according to Big Bang Theory, it's like 1.13 trillion years old. So, um, 13 billion? 13 billion years old. So, um, so the fundamentalists, they believe that, that it's, um, 6,000 years old, but in, in actual reality, there's as much evidence to prove of the existence of evolution as there is evidence to prove of the sun in the sky like there's the same amount of evidence to prove both and um well once you talk to a fundamental christian and say hey listen you know here's the structure that you've been given and it's somewhat wrong well it shifts literally your entire belief system that's exactly what maui's going through here and that's exactly what everyone must experience like this isn't something that well this is what moana experienced right like it's it's the same deal you know she had this idea that she wanted to be tribal chief and whatever, and then and then she realized that it was wrong, and then you have to shift your entire belief system, and I think that's what most people suffer from, you know? That's what a midlife crisis is. A midlife crisis is, well, I got all the money in the world that I ever wanted to, and I achieved all the things that I wanted to achieve, but I'm still not happy. Why is that? You know, that's why I think the the most likely age you are to run your first marathon is 29 because you hit the age of 30 or you're about to hit the age of 30 and you're like wait a second life isn't as much as adventurous as i thought it would be maybe let me just run a marathon just to kind of just to kind of feel like i'm alive again because this life this structure that i've chosen maybe isn't the best way of doing it so you know maui comes to this realization realizes that Maybe the structure that he's that he's had is not the best structure, and that's, well, well, he's gonna have to choose a different structure. And what is the structure that that Moana chooses? The structure that Moana chooses, and the one that she's gonna give him is, hey, listen, maybe self interest itself isn't the best idea. Maybe believing that you are the primary benefactor from your decisions, maybe that idea is the wrong idea because every time you do that you end up either hurting other people or it's not enough so maybe you should choose life instead to embrace to well that's that's oh that's a that's great so one of the things that um that he was struggling with his ego and the problem with self-interest the the problem with the ego and self-interest is both of them see the individual see maui as the highest priority, you know, like you are not, what is the word, sublimated? You are not, no, subdued. You are not below anybody, right? And if you're not below anybody, then you are the king, right? And that's exactly what Maui said when he sang a whole song, you're welcome, right? But 
the reality is when you think of self-interest, it's flawed. When you're too self-interested, you are flawed. And therefore, you must put yourself below something. You must realize that you are not in control. And, um, well, that's one of the that's one of the fundamental problems that humans experience. You know, that's why we have religion. That's why we have mythology, right? That's why we have stories. All of these things try to explain why it is that whenever we try to do something, we don't do it. You know, if I say I'm going to work out for a while and I don't do it, and I, you know, most people fail in their New Year's resolutions. I think everybody knows that, ninety two percent to be exact, and. Um, And you fail. And the question is, why am I not in control of my own actions? Right? Like, why is something, even if I believe I am completely in control, logic, or at least evidence, proves that you are not. And the question is, why? Right? Why is it that you could set a goal and achieve that goal to make $200,000 a year, whatever, and then realize that you are not even in control of your own happiness? Why is it that people who suffer from anxiety, depression, realize that they are not even in control of their own thoughts? And, well, to some degree, everybody experiences that because sometimes you'll sit back and think, why did I think that? Or why did I do that? Or why can't I do something? And um, and that's when you have to put aside your ego. That's when you have to realize that maybe something else is in control. And this is something that us humans have to grapple with for forever so um well that's why you got to put aside your ego but that's exactly what happens here so maui puts aside his ego and you see like the little the little figure here gives him like a self-hug you know like an actual self-hug and it shows you know that well that's exactly what maui did he put aside his ego he said hey listen you know if this this tattoo guy is the representation of his conscience right you know he realizes that he's been ignoring that part of him, that that little angel on his shoulder for so long. And, um, and well, he's realigned with himself, right? He's, he's purely unified. You know, that's, that's the idea in, that's the entire idea of Moana, right? The entire idea of Moana is you need to integrate that part of yourself. Instead of, instead of fighting it, what she's been doing his whole life, instead of fighting against his conscience, which before the conscience was sitting there on his, like, his peck, and he flicks it away, right? But, um, but now he's embracing it, right? And that's that's the idea. Don't fight it, embrace it, right? Integrate it into a part of you, which we will get into a bit later. But now we can see that his goal structures are realigned too. So what happens is they show on his tattoos, you know, on his tattoos, there's this vision of him fighting Maui, right? And, um, and if we're gonna say these tattoos are also a representation of, you know, his unconscious, the fact that his tattoos want to fight Maui shows that his internal goal structures, right, the things that drive him, we'll say that childish part of you, that immature part of you, that emotional, passionate part of you that wants to go and achieve your goals, is in is connected with Maui himself, right? With with his ego, with his consciousness. And well, when you do that, you're pretty deadly. Right. That, that's one of the things that most people struggle with, especially with like dieting and things like that. It's like your brain wants to do something, but your heart wants to do something else. And well, you, you, I'm not going to say you're going to fail, but it would be a hell of a lot easier if your heart was in it, too. So that's 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 nice. Right. He's got this full unification of his goal structures and. Um, and it, it shows by his conscience or, you know, his, his tattoos really saying, I'm going to go kick Maui's ass or kick Taka's ass. And then, um, and then he, he successfully turns into a bug and then he successfully, su- successfully turns into a hawk. And then you have, that's the point where he has this face, right? Where he's super confident. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do it, you know, and he actually does it. So then he gives, yeah, exactly. Right. Then he gives his little, his little conscience he gives his little you know unconscious essentially a little fist bump and that's what you see across all the all the disney movies right you have like in this case maui has tattoos that represent his unconscious thoughts or you know his his we'll say emotional motivations but that's what disney does with animals right you know in this movie you have moana with that little pig right and the pig is always you know on his on his 
on her shoulder or sort of walking with her. And then you have the chicken, right? And it's the same thing with, let's see, Aladdin, he has the monkey. Um, let's see what else. Come on, I, there's... Well, Beauty and the Beast, they have like the clock and the animal figure and the, and the figures that lie around the house. Um, which ones? Why do I not know all of the animal figures? But anyways, we know that's, that's sort of how it goes. You have all these unconscious animal figures. You know, that's, that's the traditional Disney princess, right? You have like Cinderella, Snow White, um, and Sleeping Beauty. All of them are with birds, right? And they have conversation with animals and all that. So that's, that's like your traditional Disney to see that they are, whether they are in touch or out of sync with their unconscious. So, um, so then it's nice, then it's nice. So what happens is now you have this sort of trade. So, um, so Maui shows Moana how to do the hero things because Moana showed Maui how to be himself, right? So then, uh, Maui sort of shows Moana, she says, she says, you know, first of all, now he's finally doing something that isn't in his own self-interest, right? Like, why would he have to show her, um, how to, how to, uh, what is it called? Wind sailing? Wayfinding, right? He why why would he have to teach her how to wayfind if he could just do it himself? And clearly he's looking beyond his own personal interest. He's getting in touch with life. And um And then yeah, so they arrive right at they're in the ocean, they arrive at Teka, and um And there you go, right? So so you've completed essentially the the hero's, the heroine's journey, kind of, right? And then we'll just, you know, I don't want to go through essentially everything which happens here, but I'll go through the important points as it re relates to the hero heroine's journey. So then you meet Teka, he fights Teka, and then, you know, here's this good image of, you have Maui here fighting Teka. And um, obviously we haven't gotten to the point yet where, we realize that fighting Teka is wrong, right? Maui hasn't realized that yet, but he's gotten in touch with his ego, which is which is the good part. So he fights Teka and he sacrifices himself for her, right? Because you know, um, because he his hook gets damaged, right? So they get into a fight, right? And this is this is the essential. This is the turtle flipping over. Right. You know, when the turtle flips over, it's like, you know what, maybe maybe the heroine's journey, just like the hero's journey, isn't all smooth sailing, which is just about right. They get into a fight. Um, he loses his ego. Right. He says, without my hook, I am nothing. So maybe maybe he um, he doesn't really know who he is anymore. He says something, you know, egotistical, essentially to her. And um, and you hit the low point. Right. And this happens every time. And then what happens is. Moana says she's going to go fight it herself, but then uh, Maui comes in and saves her, right? And that's that's the full completion of the hero's journey, heroine's journey, because Maui comes back and, um, we'll say, puts aside his self-interest for her, because literally there is no nothing, there is literally nothing that he really gets out of this besides maybe some sense of internal satisfaction from helping her, right? Which is essentially doing it all for her and um he saves her and then she she essentially does it herself right so this is his little sac sacra sacrifice here right he completely destroys his hook for her and that's well that's a hero right that's that's a hero um hero's journey right that's exactly what he does and then um M moana restores the heart and they meet the goddess and she gives him another hook Right, so it really shows, you know, because you made sacrifice, because you got in connection with life, Maui, you are going to, um, you're going to be rewarded, right? And well, I wouldn't say be rewarded in the spirit in the in the material world is a good way of saying it. Just being rewarded in the spiritual world by saying, hey, listen, you have put aside your own self interest for something that is more powerful than. Um, than you, right? You've put yourself below the goddess. You've put yourself below her, essentially below life, and um, and you're going to be rewarded for that. So, um, that is the heroine's journey. That is the heroine's journey, right there. I don't think there is anything more. We could just go back and 
figure out, okay, so he had five original problems. You know, did he solve all of them? Undeveloped self, he developed, right? His ego, he got below it. Um, he got in touch with he got in touch with his conscience. Um, let's see. He got rid of that idea that his value needs to come from from his accomplishments. And then finally, he looked at the heart of Tefiti and said, wait a second, this is life itself. This is not something to be afraid of. This is not a honing beacon of death. It is something to be valued. It is life itself. And when he got in connection with that, you have this beautiful ending. And that is, well, it couldn't have been done without Moana. So that is the heroine's journey in a nutshell, or that is the heroine's journey in Moana. Next time, we are going to break down the hero's journey of Moana because, well, there's a heroine's journey and a hero's journey in Moana. So, well, that's for the next lecture. See you then.